So the mini-series of now three lectures is going to be organized around the concept of space-time emergence. So this is the main theme. Okay, the person who introduces has arrived. Ah, okay. Okay. We waited for you for the so introduction. Rewind. Reconstruction and complexity of PBS. Thank you. <laughs> I can ask start. All right, so the main theme is uh, space time emergence. <coughs> and at a very broad level, what we mean by that is we have some fundamental microscopic description of some gravitating system, and there's some limit, uh, some limit, some spe certain cases where there is a coarse grained effective description of that, which we call semi classical gravity, where there's a regime where perturbatively interacting quantum fields propagating on some space time metric. And the interactions between these quantum fields and the metric are perturbative, even though the metric is dynamical. So that's the basic idea behind space-time emergence in broad generality. But in AES-CFT, there's a very specific context in which we understand this very precisely, and we would like to understand it very precisely, where the CFT is a sort of microscopic description of a quantum gravity system, which is exact. And in certain limits, say the large lambda, large n limit, we have this semi-classical emergent description of the gravitational theory in terms of a space-time metric, meaning we have a, the emergence of space-time here. Well, it's a dual description, but you could say it's literally a microscopic description of the system. Right? It's a, when you say dual description, you mean this is literally a, a duality here, so it relates it to the fundamental description. The CFT description is good at any coupling. The semi-classical gravity description of ADS is only good when we're talking about a large and large lambda limit. So the question is, when do we have this emergence in a classical so geometry? So by emergence, you mean the dual, whatever you want to call it, quantum gravity description, semi-classical limit, <coughs> Einstein gravity? Well, in, in, of certain, in certain cases, right? Not every state, not every state admits a nice and classical description. You have to take the limit in certain cases. So, you know, it, Okay. And sometimes we sometimes get an emergent description. Space. And then okay. the question but usually not. That's exactly right, yeah. Okay. And so the question is when do we get it? Um, how do we get it? How much of the space time is actually emergent from the CFT? In what way? How hard is it to actually see this emergence? Um, sub ADS locality and so on. So all these questions sort of go into space time emergence. And I'm going to talk specifically about reconstruction and complexity. And by reconstruction, in the context of ADS CFT, what we mean, this is the task of obtaining the semi-classical bulk from the CFT. And this is going to be the first part of what I talk about in these lectures. Complexity is essentially the question of, um, is related to the question of how hard is reconstruction, this task. Uh, and of course that's not a very precise statement, but we will make it precise as we go on. So as an example of reconstruction, we might imagine that we have some local bulk operator, we turn it on, and we ask, how do we see that we've turned it on in the dual CFT? How do we compute the expectation value of this local bulk operator that we've turned on in our gravitational system? So that's an example of something we might want to reconstruct. All right. So I guess you've already seen one example of this. This lectures are kind of uh, in an a-causal order. It was supposed to be given in tandem with Ahmed's lectures. So um, one context in which you've seen this is a black hole and its radiation, <coughs> where we might want to turn on some local operator in the black hole interior for an old black hole and do something to the radiation that tells us that we've turned on that operator in the black hole interior. Before you reconstruct it, what does the local operator in the bulk mean? Yeah, so that's, a, that's an excellent question, and we'll get to that. So I'm, I'm saying things in sort of uh, broad generality here. We'll get to the question of uh, local bulk operator, which we can, we can define precisely in the exactly classical limit. But of course, once we add quantum corrections, we start ha having to worry about things like um, gravitational addressing. OK, so we'll be concerned with, uh, with two questions. So 
First question, how much of the space-time is emergent from the CFT? So this is a question in principle. interior of a black hole is something that we will talk about as far as uh, when it's emergent, and then there's also how it's emergent, and you know, there's subtleties in here that uh, will all be part of the upcoming lectures. And um, so this is, in principle, how much of the space-time is emergent you know, from some subset of information in the CFT, from having everything in the CFT, from having the entire Hilbert space, you know, there's uh, many different things that go into this. And then how much of the bulk is emergent in practice? But in practice here, we mean if you have a, say, a quantum computer, which is a reasonable quantum computer in the sense that it doesn't have the circuit size that's exponential in E to the S, where S is the entropy, S is log of the dimension of the Hilbert space. So you might ask, since when do we in this field care about practicalities? Uh, you know, in principle, we typically only care about things that are in principle. But as it turns out, asking this question um, leads to a lot of insights about the way in which different subsets of the bulk are emergent. We can separate out the bulk into subsets that are emergent easily, meaning in practice, and subsets that are only emergent in principle, meaning it's very difficult to reconstruct those. So this is the, this is the reason that it's valuable to ask this, even though in this field, of course, we don't typically worry too much about uh, practicalities. So, yeah. we assume that we know uh, that we're working on the CFT and we're allowed to, the, the rules of the game Mm -hmm. That's right, that's right. Yeah, we want everything in the language of the CFT, how do we just get the, the bulk from it? How much of it, how do we do it, how hard it is? That's the, that's the name of the game, that's right. Um, yeah. Can I translate the question uh, in practice, let's say that I some run a computer on a program on a computer, how much time it would take me to see the geometry of this part, and mm -hmm. the of this part, the same. Yeah, you can, you, talk about it, you can talk about runtime, you can talk about circuit depth, they're all really saying the same thing. Maybe let me just say one more word about uh, motivating this question. So as, since you've already seen uh, Ahmed's lectures on a black hole information problem, there we know that for an old black hole, a black hole after the page time, the information about the black hole interior is contained in the radiation. But it turns out it's actually extremely difficult, impractical, to decode the radiation. It takes an exponentially long amount of time in the entropy of the black hole, if you want to think of it in terms of runtime. So, in asking questions about decoding the Hawking radiation, it's valuable to know which observers have access to that and which observers just don't have access to that, meaning observers who have exponentially powerful quantum computers and ones that do not. So this is an example of where uh, this question becomes very important. Okay, so the, uh, the structure, this moves, great. So the structure of the lectures, So today, we're going to really just worry about the definition of the entanglement wedge, which is the key player in this whole story of reconstruction and complexity. <coughs> and then tomorrow, we're going to talk about reconstruction of the entanglement wedge, or as it turns out, something a little bit more limited, which is called the reconstruction wedge. And then on Wednesday, we'll talk about the complexity. how that helps us understand better the way different, different subsets of the bulk are emergent.
So today we'll talk about just the definition of the entanglement wedge, which you may think should really only take me about five minutes to, uh, to do, but there's a lot of intuition that goes into it, and that's the reason we're going to spend a whole lecture on that. So. Any questions before I start? Okay. So, question. Given some state in the fundamental description of the system, which in your head you can associate as the CFT, though in general, we would ultimately like to also answer questions like this beyond ADS CFT, so I'll try to keep the language general whenever possible. So we're given some state, and by state I'm also including well, the possibility of it being a density matrix in the fundamental description or the CFT if you like. How much of the space-time is emergent from it? So, okay. here you're assuming that the state has some other description? That's correct, yes. So, so given the state, you if you, you are told at this point that there is an emergent geometry, we can talk about the question of when the geometry is actually emergent. And um, I'll say a few words about that, but that would have been the, the fourth canceled lecture. So. Yeah, assume, assume a semi-classical description exists, um, a semi-classical effective description exists, and we want to know how much of it can we reconstruct given access to some, uh, so to some state or density matrix in the system which is dual to it. So I'll just ask in principle, does a general recipe exist for finding uh, geometry from a state? Um, so it, it's, it depends. Um, in some cases, you can, so there's a set of conditions on the state um, that you can use to determine whether there exists a metric which is compatible with it. Um, but that metric is, is it's only in the causal domain, meaning in the region that's causally accessible to the boundary. Beyond that, um, there isn't, there are various conditions that we think should mean that there exists a geometry that is emergent. There's also a question of which CFTs even have an emergent description in the first place. So even within a CFT which is holographic, there's a question of which states are holographic. Mm -hmm. So the second question is a little bit easier to answer. Um, the, the first question is, is harder to answer. Again, there are, some, uh, there are some conditions, but we don't know if they're complete or it's not 100% clear that they're even sufficient. So it's, it's, a, it's a fairly nuanced question. For now, we're sort of dealing with the simpler case where we know one exists, and we're just trying to figure out um, whether we can see that, with how much of the emergent description we can actually get. Yeah. Typically, when you're talking about density vectors, mm -hmm. you're referring to a sort of spatial density vectors, um, where you integrate over parts of the space. Um, not necessarily. Uh, so, yeah. in the context of ADS-CFT, we will be talking mostly about that, but we could also imagine an evaporating black hole where this is the state of the radiation. Um, I guess you could say you've traced out parts of the system. Um, you can, we, can, we can assume for now that we're considering a Hilbert space decomposition which is spatially based, but in principle we might want to be able to answer this question more generally. Yeah. So this is, a, 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 at this point, a question. Um, the answer is going to be in a more specific context than the question is being asked. Oh, how much of the ball <coughs> space-time is emerging from it? Okay, I so... Never, uh, why do you need to know a priori that there is a geometry? I mean, you're trying to do something, and you get what you get. Why do you, did you need Good. the... So, so in principle, I could, I could, again, I could approach this, and then I could say, all right, let's, let's compute the um, the high point correlation functions, see if they're compatible with the existence of a whole geometry. We can do that. That's just not what I'm doing today. So today, what I'm going to fo focus on is defining the entanglement wedge when a spacetime geometry exists, rather than worrying about when the geometry exists. 
At the level of this question, we could also ask when does it exist, <coughs> but that's not a question that I'm worrying about today. Okay, so um, let's be a little bit more concrete. So this is a broad question, again, um, many questions surrounding when is this possible. Let's be a little bit more concrete in trying to answer them. We're gonna talk specifically about ADS-CFT now, and we're going to, let's specialize to ADS-CFT, and let's specialize to the case where our CFT lives on the Einstein static universe, it's a sphere across time. And we're asking, okay, we have some, uh, we're, we're talking about some static slice of the CFT, we'll call it sigma. And now we're gonna do a spatial decomposition. I'm gonna take some region, some subregion of sigma, and we're going to define our density matrix rho on R by tracing out over the complement of R on sigma. And maybe we'll have multiple copies of the Einstein static universe. So for example, this would be the case where we have uh, the dual state to pure ADS. But if we have, if we're talking about the Schwarzschild ADS black hole, then we have two copies of the Einstein static universe for the CFT. One for each boundary. And so R might be a situation where we're, sorry. What was that? I will always work in Lorentzian signature. That's right. We live in the Lorentzian universe. So here, this surface sigma will be um, the union of these two. And so if we want the reduced density matrix on R, we'll be tracing out both over this and the complement of R in this one. So, so rho sub R is going to be a trace over the complement of R of rho, where rho is the, C the CFT state on um, the complete space-time. So generally speaking, rho will be a pure state, although in principle it doesn't have to be. Okay. All right, so now we're going to define a couple more notions here in, on the boundary theory that will also be useful in the bulk. So we'll talk about so we're given this rho r over here, and that actually means that we're given a little bit more than that, or we know a little bit more than that, we actually know the domain of dependence of rho, assuming that our theory is unitary. So here we have our sigma, we have our region r, and let's define this region d plus of r, which is a set of points, points in the boundary, which such that every past directed curve from P intersects R. So roughly speaking, what this looks like is this, this triangle over here. You have a point here. Every path directed curve from this point is going to intersect R. You have a point over here. This is not true. Some path directed curves will intersect R. Some will never intersect R. So this is the, called the future domain of dependence of R. And we can similarly define the past domain of dependence of R, which is just this. But it's a set of points in the boundary such that every future directed curve from P intersects R. Uh, um, good. So I will define it to be open. So I'm going to take these to be time-like curves. You can. It depends on your convention. Sometimes you can you define it to be closed, and then you just take this to be causal curves. So this past goes to future, and that just gives you this past diamond over here, past triangle over here, and so the domain of dependence of R is the union of the future domain of dependence of R with the past domain of dependence of R. Now, one, uh, a couple of comments on the domain of dependence, since it's going to be a pretty crucial feature for us in these lectures. 
So this is D of R. Once you have fixed D of R, you can choose many different R's and get the same domain of dependence. So this R and this R and this R, they all give you the same domain of dependence. And the idea is that all of the information that's on R has to propagate to R double prime and to propagate to R prime. So all the information that's on R is present here and here. There's no new information you get um, going from R prime to R or from R to R double prime. So so the boundary, this is purely boundary statement. The that's right. So typically we define the state at a fixed time. Mm -hmm. Um, well, so th yeah, th well, this is at a fixed time. Yeah. Um, we can time evolve and then get this R double prime. Yeah. yeah. So as long as our theory is unitary, then time evolving from R to R double prime is a deterministic uh, feature. Yeah. yeah, we are assuming everything is, is the boundary theory is unitary here. In the, we'll also we'll be using the domain of dependence in the bulk, in which case the only difference here is instead of in the boundary, we'll replace this by in the bulk. And we'll also talk about the domain of dependence there. The questions. OK. So we want to refine this question. Okay, this is our role, our goal here. So the question that we want to ask now is if we're given D of R, meaning we're given the reduced density matrix on D of R, and we know the operator content of our theory, I mean, the set of operators that are localized to D of R, and we like to ask, how much of the bulk can we get from that? We can compute expectation values of these operators. We can do anything we want. We can turn on operators and so on. How much of the bulk are we able to get from that? Of the assumed to be emergent bulk. <coughs> get from the information on DLR. That is a very natural proposal, which turns out to be wrong, as natural proposals often are, unfortunately. Which is the so-called causal wedge. So let's talk a little bit about the causal wedge. So this was this is work by um, Busso et al. and Hubini and Rangamani. So the causal wedge is the region of the bulk that we can essentially get by, in some sense, tilting our head sideways and getting the domain of dependence of this. Now, I'll be a little bit more precise now. So the causal wedge is denoted WCR. Picture. So here we have a region R. On the boundary, this is its domain of dependence. And a very natural region to associate to this in the bulk is essentially the region that you can get by saying if I take some, uh, if I fire some light like geodesic or time like geodesic into the bulk, and I force it to then, or kind of curve into the bulk, and I force it to come back to the boundary, the sense in which obviously that contains information that I should be able to get from the boundary, and what so that's a natural what region. Do what do you boundary conditions. Just give it the boundary condition that starts and ends on D of R. That, that, that's all I mean by force it to come back. So it's not necessarily going to be a geodesic. Time like geodesic certainly don't do that. But time like curves, you could say I'm going to force the curve to start here, end over there. Um, and that gives us some region of the bulk, which is sort of very naturally associated to this domain of dependence, D of R. Now, this region is defined a little bit more precisely than forcing curves to return to the boundary. So the way we define this is in using two concepts. So WCR is defined as the intersection of the future of D of R in the bulk. And that literally means all the points that can be reached in the bulk by future directed curves on the boundary, intersection of this, 
with a pass to that. Uh, well, the CFT is dual to it, so it better do yes, the same thing. No, it's dual to some quantum gravity, mm -hmm. uh, so. uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. so well, it's I, this I thought you tried to ask those either the geometry. No, 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 this is not what I'm trying to ask. I'm assuming this is geometry. Oh, you are assuming. Yes, and then I'm saying, okay. suppose there is one. Maybe we know that case, but that's true. Okay. And let's try to figure out, you know, how, how it's emergent and how much of it is. Yeah. So, right, so this is the point, the set of points P in the bulk, but which we'll denote as M. Geometry, which isn't necessarily ADS, but ADS. Which isn't necessarily? Isn't necessarily ADS. That's correct, yes. So, uh, again, geometrically, is it obvious that this definition exists? Um, so, asymptotically ADS, or asymptotically locally ADS, this will always exist. Um, I am working in a, in an, under the assumption that we are in an asymptotically locally ADS spacetime. So our quantum gravity theory has ADS boundary conditions. If you want to talk about the emergence of the sitter, then you know, I'll, I will take my hat off and say good luck to you. So I, uh, here we, I want to talk about the things that are very well understood, which is the case where we have asymptotically ADS boundary conditions. So these are the set of points in the bulk that <coughs> can be reached by causal curves <coughs> that begin and end on the R. Now, why is this a natural so thing? To, yeah. I mean, what, where does it have any, what if you have wormholes in the bulk? What if you have, sorry? Wormholes. Uh, well, wormholes by topological censorship are never going to be causally accessible, so you never have to worry about this. So the causal wedge is always going to be well defined, um, even when you have wormholes, because again, by topological censorship, they're going to be um, not causally accessible as long as you satisfy the, um, the null energy condition. And even when you violate the null energy condition, if you're satisfying the generalized second law, so, in, in saying that this thing exists, um, well, look, actually, no, I take that back. I am not making assumptions about the geometry. This thing is going to exist as long as we have a geometry. Now, you could say, is it well behaved? Um, maybe, maybe not. I haven't said anything about its behavior at this point. Sorry? There could be singularities. Uh, there could be singularities, it could be violations of cosmic censorship, you could have all kinds of crazy things, but that doesn't change the definition of this. Definition is still true, I mean, that's the definition. You could say, I haven't said that this is a domain of dependence. In fact, it isn't, and that's going to be critical for us. Yeah. So sorry about my ignorance of GR, but any, every geometry has, has such a well-defined... If you, if in an asymptotically ADS spacetime, oh, okay. and assuming that your boundary is, yeah, assuming you have that you have a nice asymptotic boundary, which we are assuming here, then um, you can. Uh, this is well defined. Okay. Yeah. Independent. Yeah. Well, I, again, there. Assuming there's not any I mean, various assumptions about the source. Of well, I, again, I, I've, I've defined it. I haven't said anything about um, what its behavior is, so I can define it <coughs> independently of the of any. Any assumptions that I'm going to make, right? I can just define this as long as it's a semi-classical geometry and an asymptotically ADS map, and that it reaches asymptotically ADS, this will exist. You know, I will at some point start to make assertions about behaviors of things, and then I'll say what assumptions I'm making. Typically, it'll be something like molar energy condition, global epimolicity, etc. Okay, so. <coughs> DLR is, a, is the boundary object. So that's this thing which is purely on the boundary. And the causal wedge is in the bulk. <coughs> yeah. Do you know the union of the domain of dependence of the 
So the domain of dependence of the, the points of dr is d of r. It is not the what causal wedge. No, no, no. There's the, the, it is not the causal wedge because the domain of dependence of a so every point here is not there's no it's not required. There are causal curves that will go from this point outside of d of r. So this is not the the causal wedge is not in any sense the domain of dependence of d of r. In fact, it's not a domain of dependence at all of any of any surface whatsoever. So this is actually important. So I'm going to now discuss that. So I said that this is a natural proposal, that what we should get from the <coughs> dual description from D of R, from having the density matrix on D of R, is, um, is this causal wedge. And you would ask, why is this natural? Why is the causal wedge natural? Important to understand why it's natural before we understand why it's wrong. <coughs> So the first is a theorem from 1952, well predating ADS-CFT. So this is a theorem by Ivan Choke Buhar from 1952. And this will be useful, th the reason I'm quoting it is because it's going to be useful for us in other contexts as well. And the theorem roughly states that the domain of dependence that if you're given initial data, meaning you're given something like this R, then it uniquely determines the domain of dependence in, in gravity as well as in you know, other theories, other unitary theories. So the initial data problem in general relativity is well posed. So, sorry? So, so just give me, give me a second. I haven't said why this is relevant in, in any way. I'm, I'm beginning with the fact, and then I'll explain why it's relevant. So this tells you that if you start out with a surface in the bulk, hypersurface in the bulk, and you specify initial data on it, meaning you specify the induced metric, you specify the derivative, the time derivative of the induced metric, and you specify the, all the matter fields, the initial data there, and you, then, then you get, you have initial, the, the, the evolution, the time evolution of this gives you this domain of dependence. And this problem of getting the initial data and having the initial data and getting from it the domain of dependence is well posed, meaning the evolution exists and it is unique. So this is this theorem of choke buhar Now, what people did in, uh, Bulk domain of dependence. Yeah, sorry, what was the question? Yeah. The bulk domain of dependence. So this is a gravitational statement, so this is indeed a bulk domain of dependence here. So one of the motivations behind this proposal, that the causal wedge should be the domain, <coughs> is a statement that, well, if you sort of look at this sideways, then it looks kind of like a, you know, wick rotated domain of dependence. And you might say, oh, well, that's kind of natural, so if this this non-standard, this is a non-standard Cauchy problem, right? This is a this is a standard uh, initial value problem in GR. This is sort of a non-standard one, but you could say, oh, if it maybe works kind of similarly, then we would expect that this is the region that's dual to it, and since it's not true that you can get beyond the domain of dependence, then you might say this is, you know, you, you shouldn't be able to get further in. So that was kind of the intuitive idea behind why the causal wedge is natural. It's the first reason. Yeah. This region? Yeah. So this is so if this is a, a hypersurface H, this is the domain of dependence of H, meaning it's the set of points in the bulk okay, where this not generally light cone structure. It doesn't generally look like a nice light cone. There'll be some kind of irregularities in various places. That's right. <coughs> yeah. Unless you have spherical symmetry and you pick this to be a sphere. Other questions? Okay, so this was the first motivation why people said, okay, this is probably the region that's dual to it. That was one natural thing to do. Is this even a, a invariant state? Is, is what, sorry? Is this 
It is a gauge invariant thing, absolutely. So this is gauge invariant, this is gauge invariant, so this statement is gauge invariant, yeah. So that's another, you could say, oh, it's a math natural, it's gauge invariant. That's another one I actually didn't, hadn't thought of. Thank you. Um, so, let's see. Another reason to say that you at least certainly have to be able to construct the causal wedge is you imagine that if you turn on some local operator in the bulk, then you should be able to sort of send in an observer, you know, measure what the expectation value is and have that observer come back out to the boundary. So, so it's just another way to say, okay, the reconstruction has to be possible within the causal wedge. So there are many reasons that why the causal wedge was very natural quantity. But in some sense, it's also a really boring quantity because there's no fundamental new insight from holography here, if that's the case. We just have some uh, initial data, which sure, maybe we get that from the operator content of our dual theory. But beyond that, we just have this initial data. We just propagate it in using the classical equations of motion. And there's no new insight coming from quantum gravity as far as you know, what we can reconstruct. So in some sense, we could just say, OK, put boundary conditions on the timeline boundary and forget about holography at that point. Then we just get, do everything classically. And you know, maybe that's the way it, it, it could have worked. But fortunately for us, the real story turns out to be uh, much more interesting. So what's the way to see that the causal wedge is not the right answer? There's a simple one, which is why we you know, spent a while dividing the domain of dependence. There's a fact theorem. Um, so this is by uh, very, very recently proven by myself, Jeff Pennington, and Arvind Shabazz-Mogadon. So this is sort of a retrospective um, justification for why the causal wedge is not the right thing, which is that generically, for typical spacetimes, there does not exist a surface, a hypersurface H, such that D of H. equals the causal wedge. In other words, the causal wedge is not a domain of dependence. So now suppose that we say the causal wedge is what we can reconstruct from DR. Then we could say, all right, well, let's take a hypersurface here. This hypersurface is between this, the, the rim of the causal wedge and R. And then we take its domain of dependence. Because according to Ivancho Kimbo-R, that domain of dependence is uniquely determined by that initial data. What we find is that we can reconstruct more than the causal wedge that way. Because the causal wedge is not a domain of dependence. It's contained inside the domain of dependence of any hypersurface that's licensed through it. So immediately we get this, this, the funny situation where we say, well, the causal wedge is all we can get from our DOR, from the, from the density matrix and the operator content. But then we say, but actually, once you have the causal wedge, you can get this larger region, D of H. Uh, this H is embedded inside the causal wedge? That's right. So this H is this, so if I maybe, let me draw a slightly cleaner picture here. So this is R, this is D of R, and this here is the causal wedge. H is something we might imagine taking like this over here. So immediately we find that the causal wedge is too small. We, we can get more. Once we can determine H from this duality, we can determine actually a larger region than the causal wedge. So that's a reason that the first reason we say, okay, well, the causal wedge is not really the right thing to, uh, to think about here. Yeah. So nobody is going to claim that you can't reconstruct the causal wedge. The question is, is that the limit of what you can get? And certainly, already this argument tells you that's not the limit of what you can get. You can get more. The question is how much more. Now, something else that what, what is the, the, the steering? So okay, it's proven, but uh, what's the intuition? What's the intuition behind it? So the intuition behind it is that, um, generally speaking, let's see this. 
generally speaking, what happens is that you is the difference between firing a um, a family of null geodesics in one direction and firing it from the other direction. So what happens here is you're we're firing we we're considering this um, J bolt. So we're considering the let's say we're talking about this one is that's the past of the domain of dependence. And this region over, so this is the past of that, and we then ask, okay, we say, okay, we're given this, this H over here. Now, to get the domain of dependence of H, we're going to consider firing, uh, firing these geodesics towards the future. Generically, what'll happen when you fire these geodesics towards the past is they'll cross over and there'll be kinks in the surface, which means there's no unique way to fire the geodesics out. Um, well, so this, so there will be, so there'll be something like this happening. There'll be a seam in the um, in the in the horizon, in this past horizon, and this will result all the, the, this these seams, these intersections between geodesics are going to result in this surface here having um, having irregularities, and in particular, these irregularities, you know, they'll look like cusps. So there will be places where um, generically a lot of places where there is no unique way to fire a null geodesic back out. So the difference between the null geodesics that come in and the ones that come out is what accounts for the difference between the causal wedge and the domain of dependence of H, which ends up being larger. So that's the basic idea behind the proof. This is, this is one question for me. Why did we require that the causal wedge uh, be a domain of dependence? Why do we, why do we expect? Do, yeah, why, why do we expect it? Um, well, so I think that the reason people expect the causal wedge to be a, domain, a domain of dependence is because it's called the causal wedge. <laughs> wedge immediately makes people think of domain of dependence. It's a really misnomer. It shouldn't be called that. I would say if I had to define the a causal wedge, I would say it's the domain of dependence of H, not this thing over here. For the time, like even uh, initial. Yeah. So no, and in fact, um, so it's a it's a good question. Um, in general, we don't expect that time like initial data has a good um, initial value problem. That said, there's a theorem called the Holmgren uniqueness theorem, which you can use to argue that in certain cases, the 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 evolution is unique, but existence is, um, as far as I know, not just impossible to prove, but there are counterexamples to it. So uniqueness can be established, but existence, well, that's a different story. Yeah, question? Do you say you remain dependent on it because if you can reconstruct it, you can definitely reconstruct it? That's right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, just using the equations of motion, that's all you need. Yeah. Yeah? Is it true that if we pick any point in the valve and we look at its cause of pass, then on the boundary, it will include all of the boundary. So, so long as we take just a partial set of the boundary, it cannot be any point in the back will not be in its domain of dependence. It is only part of the boundary. So I agree with part of what you said, but not all of it. So um, it certainly is true that there's no, unless you take the entire boundary, um, you're not going to be able to include the um, a complete slice of the past of a point. Uh, but it is not true that if you take the complete boundary, you will necessarily get that. Because if you have a white hole geometry, and you take a point in the white hole, the past of this point never reaches the asymptotic boundary. So that's fine. Yeah, you yeah. But I agree with the, with the statement that you said that you, you know, in general, there'll be a leg that ends somewhere else, which is dependent on a part of the boundary. That's right. Yeah. That, you know, that I agree with. No yeah. Way. yeah. Okay. And then, of course, the the, the last reason why it's better to not have the causal wedge, to have something bigger, of course, is we'd like to be able to talk about the black hole interior. <coughs> and by definition, the causal wedge is defined that from using curves that start on the boundary, causal curves that start on the boundary and end on the boundary. By definition, a black hole interior is not going to be included in that. So all of which leads us to believe the causal wedge is not it. Or at least we hope it's not it. Okay, can you grow the bigger regime? Uh, sorry? Can you grow the bigger region? The, which, which region? The, oh, the D of H. Um, I can try to draw D of H. It's, uh, uh, the, the main thing is it's gonna, I'm going to need uh, to, so it's, it's always difficult to draw things that are not spherically symmetric. Um, so what's going to happen, let's see, so we're going to get something like, it's going to have a bunch of, 
intersections here. And then maybe we'll have some surface, which is kind of squiggly. And then its domain of dependence will be something that looks like that. And it'll intersect right over here. So there'll be some piece that's in between the domain of the, the causal wedge and the domain of dependence. It's always going to be a proper subset. Um, OK. Um, one final thing before we move on to the uh, entanglement edge. So, so, so these intersections are in the spherical direction? So, sorry? These, these intersections between the two domains are mm -hmm. in the spherical. Uh, in sphere so, if you have spherical symmetry and you pick a spherical symmetric region, you don't, you don't break the spherical symmetry, mm -hmm. then you're not going to. Th then generically speaking, you're not going to have to deal with these intersections. Um, but uh, generally speaking, you know, spherical symmetry is very special, and even in spherical symmetric space terms, if you break the spherical symmetry, then you're going to have a problem. So this, this is generic. There are very special scenarios you can engineer where the causal wedge is a domain of dependence, but those are scenarios that sort of uh, violate what's called the, the generic condition. What is what, sorry? What is this duality statement we have now? So the duality statement is we don't know what it is. We're about to figure out. Um, OK, so one final thing. The duality literally would mean that everything that we can compute in D of R, we can compute in its dual. And that also means that if we have the dual, we can compute everything that we can compute in D of R. In particular, it means that we should be able to compute the Bonoeman entropy of rho of R from the dual to D of R. Now, a very important property of the Bonemann entropy is that it's invariant under unitaries that act only on R. Now, we know that we can turn, if we turn on a local unitary, the way that the effect in the bulk is going to be something that propagates causally into the bulk, typically along the null geodesic. So, suppose that we could actually compute the Bonemann entropy from the domain of, from the causal wedge. Suppose we could do that. So, picture again. R. This is D of R. This is the causal wedge. So, if we could compute the Bonemann entropy from, you know, purely from things that are defined in uh, in the causal wedge, then because we can turn on unitaries here, local unitaries, and they propagate causally <laughs> to the bulk. And we can reach any point in the domain of dependence in the causal wedge that way by definition of the causal wedge. That tells us that we should be able to modify the geometry anywhere by turning on, and anywhere in the causal wedge by turning on local unitaries. And again, if we can compute the Bonemann entropy from the causal wedge, that means that we can modify the Bonemann entropy of R by acting on R with local unitaries. D of R. And this is, of course, a direct contradiction of basic properties of the Bonemann entropy. Can you so explain this thing? So yeah. Like, what do you mean that we can modify? So suppose that we could compute from the geometry of the causal wedge, we could compute the Bonemann entropy, this object here. Mm -hmm then that's computed from some geometric quantity in this thing here. Geometric quantity localized to some points. Because every point here can be reached by a null curve from the from D of R. We can turn on a local unitary and you know modify that causes a perturbation, a light like propagating perturbation in the bulk that will modify the geometry at that point. But because this can be computed from the geometry at that point, we've modified this. Which is of course a contradiction. So this is the reason that um, we always, we ha if we're going to compute the Bonemann entropy of R the, using the geometric dual, it has got to be the case that it extends beyond the causal wedge. 
there is a unitary on the boundary. You, know, you want to identify the dual unitary of the bug. Maybe you misidentified it. Well, so, so we, we, we do know that in certain, there exist unitaries that we can turn on, that whose effect in the bulk is to propagate causally along a line, along a line range. So that's an Yeah, that's right. So that's an ingredient that we need here. And once we have that ingredient, then we know that we can modify the geometry anywhere in the causal wedge by turning on a unitary. So if the geometry in the causal wedge is computing this, and we can modify the geometry in the causal wedge using local unitaries, then we can modify this using local unitaries. But maybe you'll modify it back to the same place. Uh, you know well, you know, once you modify, you can't modify this. Once you modify it, then, uh, I mean, you could say, oh, maybe there's a conspiracy. Yeah, maybe it's, it's like a, it's like a amalgamation. You uh, <laughs> push, it, uh, push it somewhere and then it uh, comes back somewhere else. So you could imagine that, but that's a very fine-tuned situation, which we don't expect to be true. In general, we expect that we can, we can basically do any modification that we want within this, um, and we don't expect that there's any kind of conservation of, uh, you know, a c conservation of some particular very special geometric property. And indeed, as we'll see, and it's going to be a ruling principle here. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you could imagine that. My, my point is that that's extremely unlikely, given that you can modify the geometry in, in arbitrary ways at arbitrary points. Because, because of local effects? Because you see that locally it doesn't happen? Because, because you can turn on an operator anywhere you want, and it's going to propagate in a local way uh, along a particular light ray. So you don't expect that that's not going to result in then a, a non-local change somewhere else in the wedge. Yeah. OK, so the fact is there is no known dual to the causal wedge. And my opinion is that there simply is no dual to the causal wedge, no nice dual to the causal wedge. And the way that we get the dual that we're actually interested in is going to be by asking what's the minimal region of the bulk that can actually compute this quantity. That's the, gu the guiding principle for us here. So what's the reconstructable region, also known as the entanglement wedge? Mm. Now, the guiding principle at the end is going to be this Bonhomme entropy here. So we're going to ask, how do we compute the Bonhomme entropy in gravity? And that will tell us what the entanglement wedge is. Now, what I mean by this is if we're given some state of the fundamental quantum gravity description, we're told there's an emergent bulk geometry. How do we compute the Bonhomme entropy of this in the language of the emergent Bulk, emergent uh, bulk geometry. So, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> you're insisting on the phenomenon which mm -hmm. is uh, invariant of the unitaries. Yes. Is also the Rennie We can talk about the Rennies. We can talk about various other quantities. For now, we're going to talk about the, um, we're going to focus on this one. Yeah. And we'll get the entanglement wedge from it. And then we'll ask, is that what we can reconstruct, or is there more? Or is there less? So we'll use this as a guiding principle. We're not going to use it as a proof. No, I'm just trying to anticipate the answer. Mm -hmm. So once you define that in that region, yes. we're going to say that, OK, that this bulk will not just work for the entropy, mm -hmm. but for the eigenvalue as well. Well, in fact, well, once we define this region, we're going to have to deal with the subtlety that um, the entanglement wedge is not actually the same as the reconstruction wedge. So it's, uh, it will work in a very specific way and in a very specific context. Um, so there's a subtlety that we'll get to tomorrow or the day after with, with reconstruction. But if you want to say, um, if you want to ask about other quantities, I mean, if you want to compute the remedies, you have to introduce multiple copies of the system. So then. Well, I'm going to calculate it, but it's a nice quantity of yes. boundary, which mm -hmm. is a very nice That's right. Yes. Yeah. It captures the yeah, I mean, this is this is this this thing captures. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'm going to talk about properties of it right now. But one of the single most important property of this object is that it's not a coarse grained entropy; it's a fine grained entropy. And what that means, I guess, maybe let me. This is literally the next thing I was going to say. Um, so properties of the Bonhomme entropy. We're going to look for 
we're going to look for the dual to this, we need to understand this a lot better. Yeah, question. Why would you interesting that this year children is trying to dual to D? That's not sort of going D of R, it's bounded. The what, sorry? We are interested in the dual of D of R. Yes. So mm -hmm. when you are, why we are just trying to find the dual of W C F? So this thing here is essentially what it gives us a slam dunk argument that the causal wedge is not the full extent of the dual. And so in order to begin to ask what is the full extent of the dual, we need to ask, well, what this has to at least be the minimal region that can compute this. That's, the, that, that's, the, that, that's where we're going with this. So some properties of this thing, as I said before, as I just mentioned, um, it is a fine-grained entropy, not a coarse-grained entropy. Now, what does that mean? It means that this is not coming about, the Neumann entropy is not a result of our ignorance of some of the microstates. It's not, an, it's not a consequence of our ignorance of anything about the region R, about rho of R. We know everything about rho of R. It's a consequence of the entanglement of rho of, of R with the rest of the system. So you could say, okay, you know, maybe if we've traced that part of the system, it's due to sort of that ignorance. But it's a fine grained entropy of rho of R. So this in particular means, as we already found out, this does not change with time. This does not obey a second law of thermodynamics. This thing is constant as a function of unitary time evolution. The fine grained entropy, it sort of knows more, more, more information about R goes into it than computing the thermodynamic entropy. So that's the first property. The second property is that it vanishes if and only if rho R is pure. Again, this makes sense because this is a consequence of, um, of tracing out part of the system. So if rho of R is pure, then it's literally the entire system, so this entropy vanishes. It's literally, as I said, a fine-grained entropy. Now, you could look at this and say, well, we're in quantum field theory here, and traces are not actually well-defined in quantum field theory. So this quantity is actually formally infinite. So it's formally divergent. actually divergent. Um, we, the way we deal with this is we, we have, there are several different ways to deal with this. Uh, one common one is to introduce a lattice spacing or UV cutoff, which takes this, uh, for those of who like von Neumann algebras, takes this type three, makes it into a type two. Um, more generally, it just gives us a, a scale that we can use to cut off the divergence. So we typically introduce a UV cutoff for this. Now, there's actually another divergence that goes into this um, when we're talking about large C. So if we're talking about a CFT at large C, there is going to be the divergence that comes about as a result of taking C to be large. So really, there are two divergences here, and we'll want to match those divergences to things in the bulk. Now, the fourth thing I wanted to say is that it satisfies various um, inequalities. So for example, the very famous strong subadditivity inequality so it has a, a bunch of very nice properties that can also be used as sanity checks on whatever proposal we we, give, we choose to give for the co computing the Neumann entropy in the bulk okay whatever geometric, whatever geometric construct there should be a geometric goal on these kind of precisely yeah. okay so, what how do we actually compute this? What about yeah. computing relative entropy to cancel the divergence? So yes, that's another, another good, good. So, so, as I said, there are many different ways of regulating this divergence. You can talk about mutual information. You can talk about relative entropy. Um, you can talk about a renormalized entropy. This is just um, one which is particularly nice when talking about um, ADS-CFT. We're talking about the, the, the particular proposal for computing the Neumann entropy in ADS-CFT. But there are many different ways to do this, and they're all useful in different ways. Okay, now, <coughs> let's actually ask what is the dual. So there's a version zero of this proposal, which is well predating ADS CFT. So version zero of computing entropy, computing the fine grained entropy in the coarse grained bulk description, in the semi classical gravity description, and this is the uh, Bekenstein Hawking entropy. Okay. 
So uh, what's the Bekenstein Hawking entropy? What, you know, what, what does that come into the story? Well, I sort of can't resist always bringing an anecdote with uh, Bekenstein Hawking, which is the, the very famous, um, well, especially given that this is Hebrew University, I should talk about Bekenstein. So um, there's a very famous uh, Gedanken experiment by Wheeler, where, um, which this dates to the, I want to say 1972 or so, where he essentially asked the question, um, let's suppose that we have a hot cup of tea and we throw it into a black hole. Now at the time, with they, it, was, it was known that black holes, classical black holes, don't, in the asymptotic with flat space, they don't have microstates. Um, and so that tells you that black holes don't have entropy. And okay, if you take a hot cup of tea, you throw it into the black hole, then you say, all right, um, well, I just decrease the entropy of the universe. And you can sort of throw arbitrarily large amounts of entropy to the black hole, and the black hole doesn't have microstates, right? So the entropy of the universe decreases. And um, to quote Sir Arthur Eddington, you know, if you violate the second law of thermodynamics, I can give you no hope. There's nothing for your theory but to collapse in utmost humiliation. <laughs> so, uh, so this was the, the Wheeler uh, Gedanken experiment, and it was uh, it was solved, or a proposal was uh, given by Jacob Bekenstein, who was still a graduate student at the time. So those of you in the audience, you know, graduate students, this is what you can aspire to. Um, he proposed <laughs> that, uh, sure, you know, black holes uh, don't have classical microstates, but actually they have quantum gravity microstates. And so the <coughs> entropy of a black hole is proportional to the area of the event horizon um, in, in Planck units. Generally, I'll be setting h bar to 1, but I'll just write it down over here. Uh, now, you could say this is the entropy of the black hole, but actually the V8 also stands for Bekenstein Hawking. And uh, the reason is that Hawking computed the proportionality constant here, doing a very impressive calculation of the um, temperature of a black hole. So, this was Bekenstein's proposal. Now, for this to work, you also need another fact which is the Hawking area theorem. Which tells you that the time derivative, defined roughly, of the um, area of the event horizon is non-negative, and this assumes that you satisfy the null energy condition, which is the statement that the normal components of the stress tensor are non-negative. So then you say, all right, well, you know, you throw stuff into the black hole, the black hole grows, and that tells you the entropy of the black hole increases. And so, you know, ta-da, we've saved thermodynamics. Uh, take that, uh, Sir Arthur Eddington. Now, you could say, what does this have anything to do with um, this fine-grained entropy? Didn't we just say this is a fine-grained entropy, so it doesn't increase as a function of time? So this is a clearly a coarse-grained entropy, since so it increases with time. This is more like a thermodynamic entropy. So why am I bringing this up? at the same time. Well, you'll notice that there is an equal sign over here, potentially allowing for the possibility that in certain cases, this thing is not changing as a function of time. <coughs> so we could say, well, in those cases, when it's not changing as a function of time, this may be actually computing a fine grained entropy. So what about this time independent case, which turned out to be um, essentially static black holes. Schwarzschild, Weiser Nordstrom, things like that. What about static black holes? Is this potentially a fine grade entropy in that case? And in a uh, tour de force calculation in 1995, <coughs> um, Strominger and Vafa showed that at least in certain for certain types of static black holes, this is indeed a fine grained entropy which is, uh, and it literally looked at the microstates of the black hole in um, the certain uh, supersymmetric black holes. So, yes, for certain types of supersymmetric black holes, which are all stationary. Just a, just a question, yeah. What, what do these terms precisely mean by the coarse grained entropy? So, a coarse grained entropy doesn't have to, you know, be constant as a function of time. In fact, thermodynamic entropy, we expect, increases as a function of time, the second law of thermodynamics. A Feynman entropy can't increase as a function of time because our ignorance about, r about R, we, we have no ignorance about R, so it doesn't increase as a function of time either. That's the definition, that <laughs> I'm doing not increase, 
So the finite entropy is defined in this way, but because this is invariant under unitary time evolution on R, then it's not going to change. Yeah. So, okay, so here we have this first result here. And in 2005, 2006, Rian Takenagi showed as part of a broader proposal that this is also a fine-grained entropy for static ADS work. And it is this proposal, this is what I call view one of the entropy proposal, the holographic entanglement yeah. entropy, that, um, that is going to start the course towards giving us the entanglement wedge. So what did Virenta Kanagi say? noticed that if you look at an ADS black, ADS black hole, it's a Schwarzschild ADS. So Schwarzschild ADS is static outside of the black hole interior. So if you just look at this, or this, or the union of those two, then uh, this is static. And say, okay, let's take a look at a static slice of the Schwarzschild geometry. So this looks roughly like this. This is the event horizon. And so they said, well, look at this. The event horizon is a locally minimal surface on this stationary st time slice. So <coughs> is locally minimal. The area is a local minimum over here. In other words, if you have the area functional in curved space, H here is in the induced metric on the surface where we have some surface, some Cauchy slice, and A is the normal to the surface here, T is the time like normal to the surface, and these are unit normals. So the area of the surface is computed by taking this integral, and they notice that the event horizon is a local minimum of the induced metric on this particular Cauchy slice. If you ignore the t direction, you're just worrying about what it's doing on the Cauchy slice. And so they said, OK, well, um, maybe this is true more generally. Maybe more generally, we should be looking, at least for static space times, we should be looking at the static slice, and we should be asking, what's the locally minimum minimal surface on this slice? Now you could say, well, okay, sure, it's locally minimal, but it's not the globally minimal surface, that's just the empty set. That's always going to be the global minimum. So what distinguishes this from the empty set? Want to compute the Bonhomme entropy of you know, one side, of one asymptotic boundary. Why is it that we use the, well, why is it that we would use this local minimum and not the global minimum, which is the empty set? And the reason is, suppose we were to use you know, the empty set. Well, for one, we'd get the wrong answer, but you know, why is it that we get the wrong answer? What makes this the correct surface to use and the empty surface the, the wrong surface? Well, you could say this defines for me a, a region of the bulk, right? Everything to, sort of to the right of this, between this and the asymptotic boundary. This defines that this region here, which I can say, well, I only need to know about this region to compute the von Neumann entropy. And in particular, what's special about this region is that it doesn't intersect the causal wedge. It doesn't intersect the, this, this second boundary, which is a region I know nothing about because I traced it out. Now, the empty set, the only sort of hypersurface it defines for you is this complete thing, which intersects the second boundary. And so in some sense, they could say, well, that kind of requires me to have information about D of R bar, meaning the complement of the region you're interested in. And so they said, well, you know what? Let's require a constraint on the surface of interest. I'm going to write it down now. This is all motivation. Let's require a constraint on the surface that forces it to be such that there's some connect there's a connection, there's a way of connecting this to the boundary that doesn't go through any other asymptotic region. 
doesn't go through, doesn't intersect the complement of R, which we don't want since we have no information about it. And that's known as the so-called homology constraint, which together with the local minimality of the surface <coughs> gives us the Ryuchakinagi proposal. So this is RT, which I call V1. The Neumann entropy of rho sub r, rho sub r defined as before, is given by the area of a surface x sub r over 4g for space times that are static, meaning time independent. It's not include, for example, the interior of Schwarzschild or a collapsing shell. Or generically, most space times are time dependent, but got to start somewhere, and to leading order in G Newton, not including any quantum effects at this point. And XR here satisfies the following properties. First, it is locally minimal on a static slice. Again, this is a slice where um, which respects the, the, the time independence of the space-time. <coughs> Second, and this is the homology constraint I just referred to, there exists a hypersurface H such that the boundary of H is equal to the union of R and XR. In particular, the surface does not intersect the boundary anywhere that's not R. And three, XR is the minimal surface satisfying one and two. Wait, just one second. Yeah. Uh, sure. So H here is literally this, or just this entire thing here. More generally, if we have a boundary region, this is the surface, this is H. So yeah, so um, is it the minimal surface that satisfies these. So we, have a we may have a bunch of locally minimal surfaces, which all satisfy the homology constraint. In that case, we pick the one with the least area. So what, what is XR here? XR is the uh, R? So XR is the so-called RT surface, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And you also know that it's like giving you R and giving you some curve in B of R should be the same, right? So um, sure. So, uh, so we, we're, we're demanding there exists an H that does this. That we're not saying that there doesn't exist an H that, <coughs> that, that has a different um, a different cross section of D of R, which is also a Cauchy slice of it. Yeah, so so you so it's, you just want to know that for some curve in D of R, there exists some H that does that. That's right. Yeah. The boundary wedge. Yeah, D of R would be D of R being the boundary wedge. Yeah. Where does it fail in the flat space? Uh, good. So, for so here is an example of a black hole. If you take the entire asymptotic boundary, then this is the surface, and this is the the region H. Now, what happens if we take both the union of the two boundaries? Now, we expect that the union of the two boundaries. This is everything in the system. We expect that it's a pure state. Now, if you ask, what is the you know what is the surface X R that does this? Well, it's that empty set whose area is exactly zero. So that's another example of a Ryuchakinagi surface for uh, for a black hole. Now let me make a couple of comments. Uh, does it apply only to uh, conformal spaces, only to ADS, or if there are holographic models which are not conformal? Yeah, if there was, sorry. Suppose that I take clever of trust, though it's a, it's a holographic uh, background which is not conformal. Then okay. can I use uh, this Ruta Kanayagi also? A holographic background which is not conformal. What do you mean by that? Well, it's not ideas. 
Oh, oh okay. So um, it depends. So I haven't talked about the justification of what you're talking about yet. Uh, and I probably will only do it in a tutorial, which I think you're not allowed to attend. Um, <laughs> but roughly speaking, you can use Ryuta Kyanagi whenever you can make sense of the um, of the Euclidean path integral, um, and you can make sense of its boundary conditions, and you can interpret it as uh, in terms of a partition function. So if you can do that, if you if you are happy to talk about the Euclidean path integral away from the EDS CFT, by all means, you know, go ahead and use this in other contexts. That's right, yeah. Now, you can either subscribe to that, or you can say, I don't buy the Euclidean path integral if I don't know exactly that it's computing some approximate partition function, in which case you only use it in ads It kind of depends on your philosophy here. And then for the uh, pure state, essentially, that surface should still point the um, So for, for a pure state, I mean, it just becomes the, the empty set simply because the homology constraint is not a constraint anymore. Um, we just, the, we, the homology constraint just tells us this isn't allowed. This, the the empty set is allowed. Empty set is always the least area, but it's only allowed when you have uh, when when, when you yeah you, you have trivial homology. I guess you could think of it that way. Um, I guess I just think of I don't think of the empty set as a point. I just think of it as you know an abstract thing that's just, just empty. Yeah. Uh, just a, just a well, what do these stack uh, time slices look like in this diagram? What what. Uh, what the homology slice, that's this one here. And, and, and as, as the time evolves, these slices look like this. Oh, the static slices, you mean? Yeah. Oh, so yeah. So here you have to ask, what, so these are just slices that are orthogonal to the um, time-like killing vector field. So the time-like killing vector field in Schwarzschild looks like this. And so the static slices, so this is one, sort of in, you know, on this side, they're, kind of look, they're gonna look like that. Right, so, the, so this area will change. Yeah, th that's right. So, so you, you, I mean, you never get into the, ex the interior of the black hole in this context. <coughs> now, in, uh, if you want to get into the interior of a black hole, we're going to have to talk about the covariant formulation, the one that allows time independence. We will get there. Maybe not today. Uh, thanks. Just briefly, where did the homology constraint come from? The, the homology constraint. Yes. Where does it come from? Yeah. Yeah. So the homology constraint is just a statement about the fact that we don't want to be able to, we don't want to need the, um, the complement of the um, of R to compute the von Neumann entropy of R, so we want there to be. So <coughs> it kind of intuitively comes from the fact that um, in this context, if the only way to not allow the empty set is to demand something like a, ho like a topological requirement on uh, that this that picks out this surface over the empty set, and the one that does that is one that makes a lot of sense, which is that you know, if you pick the empty set then the surface that you get, the natural region that you get as far as you know, how you compute the von Neumann entropy is one that reaches all the way here and gives you information about the complement of R, which we should not need in order to compute the von Neumann entropy of R. OK, and I make a few comments about um, Ryuta Kyanagi. So if you're on this picture over here, um, the, re the reason that the surface generally likes to hang deep inside the bulk is because of the warp factor. So it's advantageous to move away <coughs> from the boundary as quickly as you can. So these surfaces generally um, probe deep into the bulk. Of course, sometimes they'll get hung up and they won't go everywhere you want them to go. They can sort of jump and skip around. There's a whole, uh, okay. and you, they, it used to be a pr productive uh, pursuit of one's time to look at you know, constraints on these things. By now, they've mostly been mapped out. And we have a pretty good understanding of the geometry of these surfaces, what they do and where they go. Um, but again, they, they don't sort of just hang out near the boundary here. It's nice they actually go deeper um, into the bulk. Now, the, uh, a couple of other things. Now, again, because of the warp factor, this area is, uh, is divergent. And that's nice because it actually matches the divergence in the von Neumann entropy. Remember, those are also divergent. And in fact, there's, you can actually show that if you regulate this by imposing a cutoff over here at large radius, then that is going to match exactly with the UV cutoff that you impose on the uh, von Neumann entropy to regulate that. So that's pretty nice. The, um, this G over here, 1 over G, maps to the divergence you get by taking large central charge. So the divergences all match, uh, and of course this is a very nice test, but at the end of the day we do actually have a derivation of this due to Lefkowitz and Maldosena from the gravitational path integral. And I understand that you saw some version of this um, last week. Okay, a couple of other remarks. 
started a few minutes late, so I'm going to take a few minutes past an hour. We can also talk about disconnected regions or multiple regions. So let's divide up our boundary, R1, R2, R3, R4. And we can compute, we can ask, okay, what is the, what if we want to compute the minimum entropy of, of R1, then you know we can like, compute this surface, R2, we compute this surface, R3 is this surface, and R4 is that surface. But what about R2 union R4? Well, we actually have a couple of different options here. We could say, well, we could take the union of these two, or it could be the union of those two. So in this case, if it's the union of these two, H is this. But if it's the union of those two, then H is this entire thing. And which one of these we get is actually, it depends on the geometry of the bulk. It depends on how large, how, how large of a R2 and R4 are. So we can have this competing possibilities where all of these are local minima of the area functional. They're all homologous to R2 and R4, but um, which one we pick depends on which one happens to be globally minimal, which one of them has a smaller area. Now, this also shows us something a very important property, which is that x of r is equal to x of r bar. So if, this, if, the, if the dominant contribution, meaning the smaller contribution, to the phenomenon entropy, the one which actually dominates it, which gives us the, which is the minimal one, is say this one, then the phenomenon entropy of R1, R3 will be computed by the same one. So this is a property which, as we'll find out, is true classically and is grossly violated once we add even perturbative quantum corrections. Sorry? It could be that one or the other. It could be, yeah, wh whichever one it is. Whichever one is true for one region is going to be the same one for the complement. That's the, that's the one. It's called complement rate recovery. Yeah. Now, if the surface, if we get the disconnected surface here, so if it's just for R2, R4, it's this one and that one, then that means that R2, rho R2 union R4 is approximately factorizing to leading order in G Newton. So if disconnected, if this is computed by, it's called this x4, and this is x2, by the area of x4 plus the area of x2 over 4G, meaning it's probably the disconnected thing here, then um, we get approximate factorization, meaning to leading order. So this is uh, th this is something that it's, it's nice to tell us the structure of the bulk. You know, if the bulk is uh, disconnected, then we have this factorization. So already we're learning some some fundamental features of how the bulk geometry translates into the state on R, or in this case, R two union R four. Why 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 is uh, why is this implied complementary recovery? So. I guess this is called complementary recovery. If you say, well, we, should be, we can reconstruct the entire entanglement wedge, then from R we can reconstruct up to here, and from R prime we can reconstruct up to here, which means there's no part of the bulk that's not reconstructable. Now, the reason, of course, that this is equal to the complement is that this surface is, if it's minimal, put R, it's going to be minimal for R bar. And if this, so we have some Cauchy, sli some, sli some st um, static slice here, this splits it in two, well, it's gonna, that means it's going to be this, this H, half of it is going to be an H for R, and the other half is going to be the H for R bar. Um, so it's essentially the same story. Um, if the minimal one is the disconnected one for R4 and R2, then for R1 and R3, it will also be the minimal one. So if... No, it doesn't look 
So the so what I'm saying here. Maybe we draw this a little clearer. Each one of these has its own RT surface. But if we take the union of R2 and R4, we have to ask, is the sum of these two minimal or is the sum of these two minimal? Now, if the sum of these two is smaller than the sum of those two, then the entanglement wedge, the, 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 the one that computes the phenomenon entropy for R1 and R3, is also going to be those. And this is, a, this is part of the statement that if you have a pure state, yeah. the phenomenon entropy of rho r is the same as the phenomenon entropy of rho r bar. All right, I think I'm pretty much out of time. So I'm going to stop there, and we'll pick up next time with the time-dependent version. <laughs> yes, this, this also shows you where things from some of the activity, all right? Because we That's right. Yeah, I'll talk briefly about subadditivity and um, what's called um, nesting, which is that if, um, if R1 is in, is in R2, then H of R1 is going to be nested inside H of R2. All right. Can you show that uh, at least uh, include, uh, includes the project causal? Uh, yeah, so, 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 so far we have not talked about anything that happens off of the static slice. Um, in order to, the best way to show that this includes the causal wedge is to actually first formulate the time dependent version and then show that the causal wedge always lives um, inside of that. You can do it at, at this level, but it's, it's a little bit complicated. <laughs>